Uh, <clears throat> hello, this is uh, lecture number 22. We're going to be getting into some controversy here in terms of this nature-nurture question. Talk about race and intelligence and talk about genes. And um, this is a fascinating area, one that probably is uh, the single most controversial area in the field uh, of psychology. So let's begin this assessment by taking a look at this figure, uh, often seen figure, which shows uh, IQ scores um, uh, in terms of um, uh, this, distri this distribution. Once again, 100 is the average. Uh, these are the extremes. This is low. This is very high. This is the percentage of individuals uh, at each one of these uh, various um, uh, IQ scores. Uh, so if you take a look at this figure, again, IQ as measured by standardized um, IQ tests, Stanford Binet, the WACE, the WISC, 47% um, of individuals are average, okay? If you take a look uh, at this right here, you know, the bulk of individuals are scoring between 90 and 110. That's considered to be average. Um, if you take a look uh, further, include you know low average and high average uh, in that you're really talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of um, you know over uh, two thirds of individuals. Uh, and again, take a look at the extremes here. Very few individuals at the extremes, either very low or uh, very high. Uh, this is called a bell curve. Okay, and again, it looks like a bell. Uh, and again, its primary message is that at least as assessed by these standardized kinds of tests, uh, most individuals um, are uh, near, near the average. Okay, so we say IQ then is normally distributed. Okay, this is a, a characteristic in this case, a behavioral characteristic in terms of intelligence in which very few individuals are extremely high, very few individuals are extremely low, and most individuals are, uh, you know, roughly 70% are scoring around the average. So again, this is a figure that I think that you need to keep in mind um, as we go along. So there are two extreme views here of intelligence. One is saying that nature uh, the, the, the intelligence is all about nature, uh, that the, uh, our intelligence is a product of our genetic endowment. And uh, the other extreme view, of course, is that intelligence uh, is uh, more about our experiences, more about the kind of environment that we're exposed to. Um, again, these are the extreme views. The dangerous view, of course, is the one that says that it's all in the genes. Uh, and this controversy will will pop up um, as we go along in a, in a discussion uh, of this particular area. Uh, so let's refresh our memory a little bit about identical twins and fraternal twins by taking a look at this figure. And identical twins, uh, where we have one sperm and one egg, uh, the zygote divides. Now we have two zygotes with identical chromosomes and they're same sex. They're either both male or both female, but there's 100% sharing of genes. In the case of fraternal twins, on the other hand, we have a situation where there's two sperm and two eggs. Uh, the fertilization just happens to be occurring uh, at the same time. So you have two zygotes that maybe share about 50% of their chromosomes. Uh, and again, the offspring can either be both male, both female, or one male and one female. Uh, so uh, the theory behind much of the research that we're going to be discussing then is that if we look at concordance rates in terms of intelligence, you would, and, and indeed if the genes are uh, influencing uh, intelligence a great deal, then we would expect to see a higher degree of concordance in identical twins uh, than in fraternal twins uh, in terms of IQ. And again, that's a notion that we're going to be testing you know, as we go along. So again, understanding these twin studies is, is really crucial. Um, let's take a look at a hypothetical, Dan and Dave, 100% um, uh, sharing of their genes, they're identical twins. So we're saying this, let's say that Dan has an IQ of 134. What's the likelihood that Dave also has an IQ of 134? 
or we're saying uh, Dan has an IQ of 84, what's the likelihood that Dave also has an IQ of 84? In other words, we're looking at the degree of similarity, and we're looking at it in terms of identical twins um, as well as in fraternal twins. So again, this question, is the degree of similarity in identical twins um, uh, IQ greater than that seen in fraternal twins. So again, we're going to get a lot of identical twins and a lot of fraternal twins, and we're going to we're going to take a look at their IQs and we're going to see how similar uh, they are uh, in their IQs. Um, so one of the um, statistics that's used um, uh, that's uh, one of the first things that you're going to learn when you take a statistics class. Uh, is uh, this this thing that's called a correlation coefficient. Uh, and it's a statistical relationship between two variables. Um, we talked a little bit about correlations in some of our early lectures. Um, just from the vantage point of these numbers in terms of what they look like, if there was no association between two things, right? Um, correlation coefficient as computed would be zero. Um, if there was a perfect association, let's say we were looking at your IQ and that of your biological parents, and your IQ perfectly predicted what your parents' IQ was and vice versa. That would be a perfect association. So again, when you plot these things when you uh, on what's called a scatter plot, and there is a positive correlation that is uh, the higher um, uh, um, uh, the higher the uh, uh, degree of association between your IQ and that of uh, your, your parents, uh, if this is something that uh, we see and it's just very strong, then we would have this positive correlation. If there was no association, on the other hand, you would see uh, a line that would look like this. Um, so again, we have all different degrees of this, from low association to moderate association to high association to perfect association. So one of the, again, when you take a class in statistics, and that certainly is a requirement in the field of psychology, and as well as it is in all scientific disciplines, as you learn more about correlations. But it's simply looking at the relationship between two between two variables. And so let's see how this plays out when we actually do take a look at this association. You know, what is the correlation between your IQ and that of your biological parents? And why would you want to do this? Well, you share a lot of genes with your parents. And indeed, if your IQ um, is uh, something that's a product of, of genes that's been passed down to you by your parents, then you would expect to see a degree of similarity between your IQ and that of your parents. Um, and indeed, the correlation coefficient that has been computed for parents and their biological offspring is about 0.50, which is a moderate level of correlation. They're saying that there is a relationship there, that indeed it may in fact be genetic. But there's another way of interpreting this. Um, we could say that it's similar genes, that you're sharing a lot of genes with your parents, or that it's similar environment instead you know parents with high iqs they're probably going to create an intellectually stimulating environment for their kids while parents that have low iqs are not likely to create an intellectually stimulating environment um, put another way give you an example you know parents who like locks and bagels uh, tend to produce kids who like locks and bagels um, parents like me, for example, who really like the Boston Red Sox baseball team, uh, tend to produce kids who also like um, the Boston Red Sox baseball team. Uh, does it mean that that's in the genes? Well, of course not. Um, it, it doesn't. So again, this is a uh, this is not a good way, really, of testing the degree to which genes may be involved uh, uh, in in this uh, attribute uh, of intelligence. So we look at concordance rates in terms of twin studies uh, that have been done. And again, the theory behind this is in fraternal twins, they share maybe 50% of their genes. Identical twins, 100% sharing. So again, we get a lot of fraternal twins and a lot of um, identical twins. Uh, and we take a look at their IQs and we see whether or not one 
predicts the other in any pair of either fraternal twins or identical twins. So take a look at this figure that you see here. This shows correlations in IQ scores as a function of, uh, and this is identical twins reared together, identical twins reared apart, fraternal rings, uh, twins reared together, siblings reared together, unrelated individuals reared together, and siblings reared apart. The two, or actually the three most important things that you need to look at here. Uh, here's fraternal twins reared together, and their correlation coefficient is about 0.57, okay, which is the same as really the same as siblings that are reared together. Right? Take a look at identical twins that are reared apart, and their correlation coefficient is 0.75. Take a look at identical twins reared together, and the correlation coefficient is 0.86. So again, these are not different from one another, but they are different from fraternal twins reared together. And again, this kind of research has been used to support the fact that indeed genes may be playing a very, very important role uh, in terms uh, of uh, IQ. Uh, so let's pursue this a little bit more. Um, do those twin studies really obligate us to conclude that, you know, environment has nothing to do with it at all? You know, maybe the quality of the environment can improve or diminish IQ. Do we have any evidence, you know, along those lines? Um, well, let's talk about a very famous study here, one that was done by Harold Skeels. Uh, it's called the Iowa Orphanage Study from some years ago, back in the 1950s. Uh, Harold Skeels was a psychologist that was employed by the state of Iowa. Uh, and part of his job was to go around to orphanages at that time and do uh, psychological testing uh, on uh, children as they developed. And um, uh, he made an observation, a very uh, interesting uh, observation. Uh, he noticed uh, two three-year-old girls in one state orphanage, uh, orphanage the, that he was in. Uh, they were very sad in terms of their appearance, listless. They were undersized in terms of their age. They had uh, low IQs when he administered standardized uh, uh, tests uh, to them. And then some months later, he comes back. And he sees these same two girls, and they're playing around, and they're running. They're like any other three-year-olds um, uh, um, uh, uh, that you would, you would expect, the, the normal kinds of behavior. And indeed, one of the things that he learns uh, about these individuals um, and again, he does testing on them, and he finds that their IQs are normal. Uh, some of the staff members informed him, staff members at that orphanage, that they had been adopted by older retarded women uh, that were in that institution. And they, those individuals, those women, gave them a lot of love and a lot of attention. Uh, so that suggests to him uh, a, a very interesting experiment. Uh, and his experiment goes like this. He takes some other three-year-old orphans and he brings them to an institution where they're going to be reared in the presence of those older retarded women who are going to give them a lot of support, a lot of attention, a lot of stimulation. And what he finds is that they improve a lot of their health and their happiness, their maturity, and most of all, in terms of their IQ. The increases range from 7 to 58 IQ points. I mean, that's almost unheard of. You know, most people at this time believe that IQ is unchanging. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't substantially change, doesn't go down, doesn't go up. Uh, the average increase uh, was about 28 points. Uh, fascinating study and, and one that received a great deal of attention at that time. Orphans that were reared by older retarded women um, uh, excuse me, that were not reared, uh, this is a control group, they're not reared by these older retired women, actually showed losses in their IQ, uh, with an average loss of being in the neighborhood of about 30 IQ points. So again, this is a very famous study, and it suggests that, you know, environment may be playing a tremendous role uh, here. Uh, if you take a look at 
some long-term studies uh, that were done. Skeels studies these orphans over the next 30 years, and what he finds is that they're even more different than they were in his um, initial observations. That is, as adults, the children that had that exposure to that older retarded woman, they were healthier, they were happier, they were better adjusted, they were a lot more productive um, in their lives. Uh, and indeed, there's a lot of more recent adoption studies that have been done, which shows that if you are placed, for example, in a good home um, um, uh, as an adopted child, your IQ will actually uh, increase uh, beyond what you would expect of the, uh, for, for their biological uh, parents, or the IQ of their biological parents. So this really counteracts this whole idea that it's that it's all um, um, in the genes. I mean, this is showing that the environment can be playing a huge role. Um, so let's now, uh, with that as a background, get into this whole area of race and IQ, which uh, indeed is very, very controversial. Please take a look at this figure. It's a very important one. If you take a look at IQ in African Americans, which is in the blue, Hispanic Americans, which is in the green, white Americans, which is in that uh, you know yellowish gold um, color, and Asian Americans, which is in the red, here's what you find. And again, the IQ is measured by way of standardized tests, the WACE, the WIS, the Stanford Binet. Here's Take a look at this in the blue African Americans. Again, you get this bell shaped curve, but what this shows is that African Americans on the average tend to score about 10 points lower <clears throat> than that of uh, either Hispanic Americans or white Americans. Uh, and again, here's the curve for Hispanic Americans. It's in the green. Here's the curve for white Americans, right? Caucasians, and here's the curve for Asian Americans, who tend to be higher than everybody. Okay. Um, and again, this has been interpreted by some as there being a racial difference in IQ. So we need to pursue that. We need to take a look. Let's talk a little bit about this very divisive figure that we see here, a psychologist by the name of Arthur Jensen, who back in the 1960s started publishing some very controversial papers. Uh, in a 1969 article, for example, uh, Arthur Jensen says, well, heredity is about 80% of an individual difference in I, the differences we see in IQ. So if you take any two individuals, and one, one individual, again, just select them randomly. One individual has an IQ of, uh, let's say, 120, and the other one that you've randomly selected has an IQ of 80. What he says is that almost all of this is, is due to heredity. Okay. Um, and at that time, uh, Arthur Jensen um, would go and speak at various colleges and universities, and for the most part, uh, he was met with an enormous amount of hatred um, uh, to a point where he had to be protected by um, uh, uh, federal uh, troops, um, uh, state, uh, uh, state troopers, uh, all kinds of security whenever he gave a talk because there were so many threats against his life. Uh, so again, African Americans score on the average of 10 to 15 points lower than Caucasians on standardized IQ tests. And what Arthur Jensen is saying is he's concluding that this is innate, that it's all about genes. And that's what's determining differences in IQ between African Americans and Caucasians. Again, an incredibly controversial um, uh, statement. So if we begin to pursue this a little bit more and ask some of the uh, obvious questions, you know, are his conclusions really ones that are relevant? You know, African Americans and Caucasians both show a lot of individual variation in IQ. Um, to think that an individual score 
uh, is somehow affected by the average of your race, I think is, is very naive. Um, but let's also take a look at it from this uh, perspective. Let's assume um, that there is this inborn racial difference, okay? Uh, let's assume that that's true. Um, think about how that would affect um, our educational system. And think about how it would affect programs, which at the time, uh, programs like Head Start, uh, which in particular, uh, money uh, was funneled by our Congress um, into um, uh, low income areas, um, which uh, for the most part, uh, there's very heavy representation of uh, African Americans in those populations at the time. Um, uh, what if we assume that this this was genetic and hence unchanging, then that as a congressperson, if you were told that and if you were sold that, that might affect your desire to want to spend more money. Uh, on these programs that were meant to improve performance. Because you're saying, well, it's in the genes, so why should we even bother with this? And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. Jensen's um, conclusions were ones that were pushed on Congress and indeed a lot of these uh, programs, which benefited not only African Americans, but also um, uh, uh, all races. Um, uh, to give kids a boost that were in low socioeconomic areas in, in, in terms of uh, giving them enrichment, um, this, uh, uh, these programs were terminated. And his article, let's accept the fact that this was only his considered opinion, uh, but it stirred up an enormous amount of emotion and individuals were racist um, uh, in our country uh, approved of what Jensen was saying and individuals were against it. Absolutely, you know, um, they deplored it. Uh, people who were enemies of racism. So indeed, this is an interesting um, uh, a time uh, uh, when Jensen's work uh, was coming out. So just why do African Americans score lower in, uh, uh, than Caucasians on IQ tests? Again, this is, this is something that persists. Um, this is something that we continue to see, but interpreting it in terms of what it means is something that I think we're a lot more enlightened about now. Uh, African Americans and Caucasians from rural backgrounds and low socioeconomic conditions score lower on standard intelligence tests primarily because of the following. They don't have equal exposure to the white middle-class culture that standardized intelligence tests typically are based. Uh, so indeed, um, you know, take away that factor and, you know, uh, IQ is probably the same, you know, that race does not play a role. But let's dig into this bit deeper. I have a series of studies, actually three studies, that I think are crucial. Um, one study was of 130 black and interracial children. They're adopted in white families. Those white families were above average in education and occupational status. And when you take a look at those adopted children in terms of their IQs, they were found to have an average IQ of 106, okay, which is actually higher than the national average of 100. So that would really argue against this, you know, genetic kind of interpretation. Um, here's, you know, some mythology here. Um, it, it, it's clear that there are physical appearance differences between African Americans and Caucasians. But please understand that they don't represent distinct biological groups. When we go and we take a look at the human genome and we take a look at it in African Americans and Caucasians is, you know, racial categories can explain only about 6% of human variation, right? That's tiny, that's extremely small, right? You know, indeed, one of the things that we know is that differences in gene structures you know, where they are known they're greater within races than they are between races. 
So this whole idea, this whole premise then, that, that African Americans and Caucasians represent very different biological groups simply is not true. So the whole premise behind these studies is really ridiculous. Um, take a look uh, at a second study uh, that I want you to remember. When you take a look at black po populations, there's um, you know, a, a enormous variety in terms of uh, lightness of skin color. You know, some African Americans are very light, some African Americans are very dark, all different gradations um, of, of, of skin color. And it's thought to represent uh, intermixture with whites. So what one scientist found was that if you were African American, the more white you were in terms of your skin color, that correlated positively with IQ, meaning that your IQ was higher. Now let's let's analyze that a little bit. If we really take a look at that from um, a more reasoned perspective, you know, first of all, these correlations are quite low, and they really can be explained on the basis of environmental difference. Think about this for a moment. If you're African American and your skin color is light, it's associated with a lot less discrimination and a lot greater opportunity. Um, so indeed, uh, there's some recent studies that have been showing this absolutely no relationship between um, a person's degree of African ancestry and intellectual ability. So again, the whole premise behind these studies is really absurd. It's, really, it's ridiculous. A third study that I want you to remember is one that was done in post-World War uh, II uh, Germany. And it was a study of illegitimate children that were fathered by U.S. servicemen, and this was done during the post-World War II occupation of Germany. And um, uh, when you take a look at those children, these children being raised by, by white German mothers, uh, again, similar social status, they're matched with children of the same age in the classroom. Here is what they find in these studies, no IQ differences between those children whose fathers were black and those whose fathers were white. So indeed, this, this also uh, suggests that we're, we're not really talking about any kind of inborn genetic differences here, that this is really um, absurd uh, uh, to be talking uh, about this as being a factor in terms of racial differences. So the argument goes then that uh, uh, Arthur Jensen, many believe that his conclusions were wrong, but they said, well, Arthur Jensen says, well, I'm going to develop a, another test then. Uh, it's a test that's culture free. And um, here's what this test is going to be. You know, if I was to take a glass and pour some uh, milk into it, the milk line, here's the glass sitting on this table. The milk line is going to be right here. Okay. But what if I tipped this glass in this manner that you see here? Where would the milk line be? Would it be here or would it be here? Okay. Um, it's a fascinating question. Uh, and indeed, uh, what most young kids say that are uh, Caucasian is they say the milk line is, you know, looks like this. Okay. But most African American kids of that same age, and again, we're talking about like eight to 10 year olds, they say that it looks like this, which is clearly the wrong answer. Okay. So um, again, this is a, you know, a very interesting um, uh, uh, so-called culture-free test. I don't think it means a thing. Uh, I think that this too can be explained on the basis of experiential uh, environmental kinds of differences. So um, this controversy is one that has continued. Uh, a book uh, that was uh, written by uh, psychologist Charles Murray at Harvard University. Uh, he says that IQ is both inherited and environmental. Um, and indeed, uh, this book, The Bell Curve, um, raised a lot of controversy. In the book, he says IQ does predict some things. It predicts what your income is going to be. Uh, it predicts what your job performance is going to be. It's going to predict whether or not you have a child out of wedlock. Again, low IQ. 
uh, you tend to uh, be at risk for having a child out of, out of wedlock. Involvement in crime, lower IQ is related to involvement in crime, and so on. Um, and he says that IQ is a much better predictor than parental socioeconomic status or of education. Right? Racial differences in IQ really are still being debated, again, in spite of the controversy generated by Charles Murray. Again, he says he thinks it's both environment and uh, uh, genes, but again, he throws in some of the research that's been done in these areas. Uh, and a lot of that research, I think, is very flawed. So yet another researcher in this area by the name of Eric Siegel strongly believes that the whole premise behind the bell curve book and the premise behind doing these studies looking at racial differences in IQ is just flat out racist. Uh, he says the bell curve prompts you to prejudge by race. Okay, just the very premise of the of the uh, of the work itself um, uh, is is signaling to you that there must be something about race uh, that's involved with intelligence. And again, he says, why would you want to even investigate racial differences in IQ to begin with? Uh, especially when you go back and you take a look at the Human Genome Project and what we know about African Americans and what we know about uh, uh, Caucasians, you know, we're so similar to one another in terms of our genetic background. Uh, so Siegel says the book doesn't really steer readers clear of that racial prejudgment. And again, he believes the book itself is racist. So, um, you know, again, this is controversial, extremely controversial. So when we do take a look at this um, issue, um, the, uh, the, that of genes and the environment and IQ, um, the concept that has been advanced, which really comes from biology, it's called biology, it's called the reaction range concept. And essentially what it says is this, um, our, our genetic background for a particular trait, in this case, intelligence can exist along this continuum that we see here from either high to low. Our phenotype, that is the expression uh, of that genetic background, uh, whether it's a physical characteristic or behavioral characteristic, and again, we're taking a look at a behavioral characteristic, uh, that of intelligence can be high or can be low, but it's really the environment that's going to determine whether or not you reach these extremes. Okay. So what we're saying here then is this, genes are setting the limits, but really the environment determines whether or not those limits uh, are going to be reached. I want you to think about this reaction range concept, and I want you to take a look at this figure right here. Um, again, let's apply this, and this is, you know, hypothetical, but let's apply this to uh, intelligence by taking a look at three different environments. One is an enriched environment that's in this uh, light brown. Another is an average environment, which is in this blue, and uh, in a uh, deprived environment, which is in this green. And this is uh, along the horizontal axis. We have IQ scores, okay, as measured by standardized uh, IQ test. And uh, what this, uh, again, this represents the quality of the environment for realizing that intellectual uh, potential. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some hypotheticals here. So let's first take a look at this deprived environment. And let's take a look at these three individuals, George, Abby, and Teresa. Take a look at George. His uh, hypothetical inherited reaction range goes from about 65 to 85. When we actually measure his IQ, he's at the low end of his inherited reaction range. He scores 70. Take a look at Abby. Abby has an inherited reaction range that goes from about 94 to 115. When we actually measure Abby's IQ, uh, it's 95. Again, low end of, um, the, uh, of her inherited reaction range. When we take a look at Teresa, Teresa has an IQ uh, inherited reaction range that goes from 125 to about 145. Uh, when we actually measure her IQ, she scores 130, which is at the low end of her inherited reaction range. What's common here? Well, they're all in the same environment, a deprived environment. They have 
different reaction ranges, right? But when we take a look at how they actually score on a standardized test, they tend to score at the low end of their inherited reaction range. Okay. Take a look at this average environment now. Three hypothetical individuals ping an inherited reaction range that goes from, well, let's say, about 75 to that of around 95. Um, again, the measured IQ is around 85. Take a look at our inherited reaction range that goes from about uh, 96 to about 117. Actually, uh, measure Bart's IQ, and it's 110. Take a look at Sylvester inherited reaction range that goes from 113 to about 150, uh, again, with a uh, uh, measured IQ of 125. What do they have in common? Well, they're all in the same kind of environment, average environment. They have different reaction ranges, right? Uh, but when we measure their IQs, they tend to be in the middle of their inherited reaction range. Right. So now let's take a look at an enriched environment, one that uh, you know is very stimulating. Take a look at these three individuals. Here's Suad. Suad has an inherited reaction range that goes from about 65 to about 86. When we actually measure Suad's IQ, uh, standardized test, uh, scores an 85. Take a look at Latoya. Latoya has an inherited reaction range that goes from about 104 uh, to about 130. Uh, again, take a look at her actual measured IQ of 125. And now Craig, who has an inherited reaction range <clears throat> that goes from about 125 to 136. When we actually measure Craig's IQ, scores 135. What's in common here? They're all in an enriched environment. Right? They have broadly different inherited reaction ranges, but when we measure their IQs, they're all at the high end of their inherited reaction range. So indeed, genes set the limits, but the environment is going to determine the extent to which we reach those limits. So in our next class, we'll begin to take a look uh, at um, uh, you know some of the uh, some of the, some of the other work that's been done in the area uh, of development, uh, and uh, uh, we will perhaps be revisiting you know some of these uh, issues as we go along.